Hello everyone, it's Oliver Harper here and I'm back with Rob Hill for a commentary on the Van Damme classic, Bloodsport. Now this was Rob's choice, so Rob, are you excited for some Bloodsport? I am, I am. I, I absolutely love this movie. This is probably the most seminal action movie in my childhood. <laughs> yeah, I think so. It's up there. It's definitely... It's, it wasn't the, the, the Van Damme movie that got me into his kind of filmography. But it was like, I think it was maybe the second or third. I was like, oh my God. And I ended up watching this the most out of his kind of earlier films. Um, yeah, yeah, it's the same for me, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I think I started off with Kickboxer, then it went to yeah. Bloodsport. So it's, it's the wrong way around, but you know, in terms of I don't think release Bloodsport dates. got. A, I don't think the, the video release of Bloodsport in this country was, was quite as big a deal as it was elsewhere, somehow. Because. I, everyone I talked to about this has the same experience, yeah, that they kind of missed Bloodsport, but then Kickboxer was huge, and you went back to Bloodsport after that. Yeah, I had the um, the sort of uh, budget version uh, from Warner Brothers, the Screen Classics release of Bloodsport from the mid-90s, or maybe early 90s, so it just got, that's how I discovered it, it's like £5 in WH Smith's. My mum had to buy it for me because it was an 18-rated <laughs> movie. Now I think it would be at 15 or 12, really, but... Mm. Now, folks, you can enjoy the podcast by itself, but if you wish to sync up the commentary with your own copy of the film on Blu-ray or an NTSC DVD, you need to put the timestamp to zero and press play now. Now, the story of um, how Van Damme got involved with Canon Films is always the story is slightly different from whoever you speak to, especially in the Electric <laughs> Boogaloo documentary when they mention what Van Damme did to get Menachem Golan's attention. Either do like a split kick or, you know, a sweep or a hurricane, you know, whatever, some sort of roundhouse kick in front of him. But because they were saying it was in his office at the Canon Studios. But the story, I think, was probably uh, the, the truth in all this was that he Van Damme met him at a restaurant. Yeah. And I think he did like a, a kick or something in front of him. And then Menachem gave him his business card. And then Van Damme went to Canon Studios and basically loitered around for ages until Monarchum was free. And he sort of begged and pleaded with him to sort of, you know, put him in a film. Because he was in, you know, um, was it Breaking? That, um, yeah, he'd, be, he'd been, yeah, he'd actually been in a Canon film already. Yeah, just dancing in the background, you know, which was very amusing. Because he had just done No Retreat, No Surrender. So he was, he was playing a villain. Yeah, and, and Black Eagle as well, yeah. Yeah, so it was he wanted to be a star, and um, so we gave him Menachem gave him blood sport, but it was uh, Menachem wasn't a fan of Van Damme. No, you know, until no. this movie was a success, you know he was poison. You'd always say he poisoned the box office. You know, <laughs> no, and I think that's why it sat on the shelf for so long after it had been filmed. Golan just yeah was not a fan. They'd met, they actually met earlier apparently at the Milan Film Festival in like something like nineteen eighty. Because Van Damme had spent a good decade, really, just desperately, desperately trying to make it. He'd he'd been so he'd spent a few years in Italy. He'd spent he spent some time in Hong Kong before eventually making his way to Hollywood. And allegedly, Menachem Golan said to him in 1980, "You come see me when you get to Hollywood," um, which he did and couldn't get in the door. But yeah, there 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 were some vague connections but ultimately Van Damme says he just happened to see him coming out of a restaurant uh, blatantly Van Damme knew he was there or just camped outside that restaurant waiting because he was he was creepy Van Damme in his wanting to make it phase you know he got um he got stopped by the police for he was trying to climb over Chuck Norris's wall because in his mind he'd go in he'd, he'd get into Chuck Norris's house and make friends with Chuck Norris well, there is a video of Van Damme trading with Chuck Norris, so they did become friends. Exactly. Ultimately, that's exactly what happened. Um, through Van Damme's weird, creepy hanging about thing, eventually he did, he, he he did find himself in the person of Chuck Norris and Bill Wallace, um, another karate star. And apparently, Bill Wallace was said to Chuck like, "Get this guy's weird. Get rid of him. We did. We don't want him hanging around." And Chuck kind of took took pity on him, and 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 this is you know this is a story told from a couple of different reliable-ish sources. Chuck basically took pity on him, and he sort of became the unofficial gopher of that little group of of, of friends that Chuck was kind of the king of. And in fact, his first his first um, 
role that came out of that was was going to be in Missing in Action. He was going to be a uh, he had a small stunt role, but also a small speaking role allegedly uh, planned for Missing in Action. But then this came up, and he he walked, and apparently that upset Chuck. Whether that's true or not, but it's interesting that obviously because he, you mentioned here Van Damme playing a stunt a stunt performer, but he was obviously a stunt performer in in Predator. You mm. know? You know, in the, the early concept design of the Predator, we had to wear a red suit, and Van Damme was like, he struggled in it. It was too hot. He kept passing out, and he couldn't do what he wanted to do. Was basically show off. You know, yes. he was all covered up <laughs> with this kind of weird, crappy alien design, and he got fired. And um, yeah, and that story itself is always changing. When who you speak to, like you know, if it's one of the FX guys, or if it's like Bill Duke, uh, even Joel Silver, they all got a different opinion on how it all transpired of him being hired and fired. Yeah. I think the one thing that we can be sure of in that whole Fiago is that Van Damme thought he was playing a much more significant role than he was. He 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 thought that he was only going to have a painted face or a little light makeup or whatever. He didn't realise he was his whole face was going to be behind a mask and obviously for someone like Van Damme that's extremely important. Well yeah, he's a you know good looking guy, you know. He's beautiful. It's pretty. <laughs> it's, it's got. It's so dreamy. The um, it's uh. Well, that was his selling. You know, of him was it was it was it was that he was a leading man. He had the leading man look. Yeah. But also he had you know incredible sort of um, physique and uh, flexibility. I mean, it's always the sort of argument with uh, Van Damme and his knowledge of martial arts was that we, we we know he took part in tournaments because it was under his original surname, you know, um, so people like I said he was a fake. He wasn't a fake at all. But uh, it, it was a sort of, his martial arts kind of a mix of ballet mixed with uh, martial arts, wasn't it? Because it's very much like the kicks he does. You yeah, know. He, he, he trained in both from, I think something like 12 or whatever. But yeah, obviously his whole thing when he got to Hollywood was look at how flexible I am, look at what I can do with my body, rather than look at what an amazing martial artist I am. <laughs> Which is, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, if you can do what you need to do, yeah, yeah, yeah. does it make any difference if you're a seven-time world champion or if you're, a, a, you know, a, a whatever? It's It's about, the thing with martial arts movies is like, there's a difference between fighting in real life and what it looks like on on mm-hmm. film, you know. And if it looks good on film, then you know you're gonna you're gonna win over the audience. And Van Damme has some of the best kicks on film. You know, this always look good. Exactly. And in fact, this movie is a great example of that. Uh, yeah, the difference between someone who's just sort of athletic, someone who can do a bit of martial arts, and someone who's actually a fighter. You see them all later in the actual tournament, in the actual kumite. There are the, the the actors involved are a complete cross section, a complete spectrum of that. You know, people who are clearly, you know, frankly, triad killers, and people who are clearly just actors. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of this film is that it does provide like a wide variety of martial arts styles, and I think this was kind of, you know, it sort of rejuvenated the martial arts genre. And I think it was, uh, you know, because we had actually Enter the Dragon and there was a few martial arts films in the 80s that were sort of, you know, respected, like the Octagon, things like that. Chuck Norris was very much in the Western market handling that, you Mm -hmm. know. Um, And Van Damme was seen as this kind of like a new Bruce Lee in some way uh, to the Western audience. And, you know, the tournament thing had, hadn't really been around for a while since Enter the Dragon, so this kind of brought it back again. Yeah, and also you could, I'd argue that this is the first true tournament movie, martial arts tournament movie, because it's the first one... I was thinking about this last night. I can't think of a martial arts movie in which the tournament is the whole point. Yeah. That it, you know, in which it isn't just part of the... Story. Like Enter the Dragon... Is it's it's a it, I think you I think you can call that a tournament movie, but it's not the point of the movie. It's a James Bond movie kind of like plot line mixed with a tournament. You know, it's very much like you know Bruce Lee is kind of like James Bond sent in with, on a mission. Yeah. Um, and we had prior to this with the success of the Karate Kid films. Yeah. Um, by this point, it was only like one and two this had come out, but the first one's very much the tournament is the end of the film. It's not the main story and that's often how it is in 
in the in earlier tournament movies, it's like the the Asian ones as well. Like um, Five Fingers of Death is a, is a tournament movie, but it's not the whole point of the movie. You know, it's there's a, a, a Master of the Flying Guillotines, another one, the, the, but this is just the just the tournament. I mean, that's the whole point of this movie. It's not really a character study of Frank Dukes. It's not really a, a Rome. It's not really anything else other than the triangular shape that you want from a tournament movie. Yeah, and it's well, it's 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 all set up. It's all kind of built upon the idea of taking part in the Kumite. You know, um, it, which is, I suppose, a, a sort of um, the story came from Frank Dukes, who had written this well it was was it an interview or was it something he'd written about this kind of secret tournament yeah. in, in Hong Kong which I know I think it's, no, it wasn't it was actually I think it was in the Bahamas it was in the Bahamas yeah 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 in Black Belt magazine in the early 80s yeah and it was 19 I think I think the original article was 1980 and Dukes was talking about I think the period sort of in the early 70s was when he claimed he'd he'd got he'd had this incredible run of of victories in this tournament which has 60 rounds which 60 is, rounds like, god I and mean, this is how he because he obviously he's been called out uh, for for, for all, almost everything he has said if not everything uh being complete bullshit you know the, the, the story is not based on any kind of fact at all but he did an interview not so long ago with uh are you aware of the channel um viking samurai Yes, yes, the guy uh, in that who runs that channel, uh, he's also he, he plays a role in the last Kumite movie I edited. No, oh, does he really? Yeah, oh, yeah, exciting, yeah. exciting. Because he interviewed Frank, he's interviewed a bunch of people. Hasn't yeah, he? yeah, so, and he did he did quite an interesting interview with Frank Dukes because he's you know he's trying to be analytical about it, and and Dukes you know he put up a fair argument sort of explaining that the reason he has so many victories there was that you had all these. You know, it wasn't just half a dozen fights, whatever. But then you start doing the maths, and a, a lot of people have done this online. And for a sixty-round knockout tournament, you would need, I think, it was something like a hundred and twenty trillion um, competitors <laughs> to start. <with. laughs> because obviously, every time you add a round, you have to double the number of competitors. Right. So once you get up above, like you know, a handful. You, it starts well it increases exponentially from the start and yeah it, it, none of it makes any sense but the, the, it, that's an interesting interview on viking samurai's channel i don't have any connection to him i don't know i, I don't know the guy but it's an interesting interview that one well, it, well sheldon lettish who um was interviewed from uh, my in search last action heroes documentary said you know like um that the the story Frank told was very much he said it was very bloody these tournaments and they thought oh we just they coined the phrase blood sport which they thought was like an amazing title for a kind of for a for a film you know and I think I suppose to give credit to Frank Dukes is that he wanted to sort of bring back the sort of tournament you know story to the movies again and maybe it was a combination of him and Sheldon. Um, but I think the early discussion was to like go check out this guy who's in No Retreat, No Surrender, and that sort of got, you know, Sheldon intrigued by Van Damme's kind of, you know, presence on screen and his martial arts uh, skills. Because he was an early um, drum beater for Van Damme, wasn't he? He's one of, one of the few people I think Sheldon Lettish, one of the few people who thought he could actually act and that he'd and that he'd be he'd be good. Well, Sheldon knew how to get the best out of Van Damme, I think, in terms of writing and how to, and what he could say and what he could do on, like, with his face and to camera. Because Van Damme's got a lot of nuance in how he, you know, pulls his expressions and how he looks at camera, you know. Um, I mean, Albert Pyun kind of famously said he, Van Damme was more concerned of how he looks than how he acted. <laughs> but um, I think during that period where Sheldon worked with Van Damme, things like A Wall, aka Lionheart, and. Um, um, what was a double impact? You know, yeah. he, he knew he knew how Van Dam knew how to get the best out of Van Dam, and obviously this is how their friendship sort of started because obviously Sheldon had, you know, had worked with Stallone on Rambo Three, yeah. So he he was already built up a reputation as a good writer of action movies, I suppose. And 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 again, they're two actors who Stallone and Van Dam, who I mean, they haven't got any range, and yeah, we you can laugh at them. You're normally normally you're laughing at them because they're being 
asked to do something that they're clearly not able and not suited to doing. Exactly. Like you say, if you if you write them within themselves, then I, I don't think there's anything wrong with Van Damme's performance in this movie. I, I really don't. I, I, I don't see what the problem is. I think Van Damme really ups his game in this because he, re- he, has to sh- he has to show the audience what he can do and he does his, some of his best fighting in this movie because in the following films he does, he kind of, obviously Kickboxer kind of follows but I think he does far better work in this than he does in Kickboxer. Yeah, I um, agree. And because he's three picture deal we had with, with Cannon once they signed him so he did with Bloodsport, um, Cyborg and then it would be Death Warrant. Was he Death Warrant uh, didn't get finished by Cannon. They'd started it, but then MGM took over because Cannon had financial problems. Obviously, a lot of people get confused thinking Kickbox was a Cannon film. It was distributed by Cannon, but wasn't financed by them, mm. as far as I'm aware. Um, but um, we, we haven't actually talked about what's happening on screen with this. We, <laughs> most people are like, what's going on? Um, but yeah, we've gone through the sort of flashbacks, and now we're sort of training montage to prove that he can take part in the Kumite. And um, I always love his little montage because obviously it's all scored wonderfully by Paul Herzog yeah. who um you know one of the best of the 80s simps composers who they did a couple of films and sort of didn't find any more work because they wanted I think the the uh, market had changed for filmmakers on wanting synthesizer scores I thought it sounded too cheap and um wanted orchestral stuff again and um so he became a teacher you know but he's now back um yeah. the last Kumite scoring that and uh had a few conversations with Paul, helping him with, you know, the scenes he wanted to uh, be scored. And um, he wonderfully said to me, um, I, I didn't realise at first, because I sort of checked this massive email chain of back and forth of other people, and he said my editing was like a, a, a dream for a composer. Aww. Because it's like the timing, how I edit stuff fits um, the timing for him. So I was like, oh, that's wonderful. So Praise from Caesar, that is. <laughs> And there's a big smile on my face. So yeah, for people listening, I mean, obviously, in in in, the, in the, maybe years to come, people hearing this commentary, um, the Paul Herzog score is um, really good. It really captures what he did on Blood Sports. So. I think yeah, it, I think it's well. In I think in, in Blood, I'm excited for the last Kumite. One of the main reasons being the score, to be honest, because it's just unbelievable. This movie score. Yeah, I mean, because some of my friends have, um, you know, who own the Blood Sport and Kickboxer soundtracks and listen to them on a repeated basis just to sort of, either when you're working out or going for a run or just wanting some cheesy synths to cheer you up, you know, especially with Blood Sport at the end when it all kicks in for the, the hero theme as he defeats Bolo. Um, I love the, the montage was so funny. It's like try, trying to catch a fish, you know. Yeah. Oh, that's impressive. It's like. Was that the first montage? I think there are six. Is it six montages in this? Well, it's all inter. It's all intercut, though, isn't it? <laughs> I With his, his, well, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry, the whole film is full of montages, but this sequence here, the training montage, that's a that's a, that's a very lengthy flashback he's had. As much as I love this film, this is just not how you open a movie, is it? It's <laughs> this. It, it, I, it's unbelievable when you stop and think about. It. I mean, there's been no action so far and and there won't be for for a little while yet but it's all it's all building the character it's all it's all valuable stuff it's just i don't know maybe it would have been a little bit better sort of broken into pieces and slipped here in here and there and if you didn't have roy chow here well he's from enter the dragon wasn't he that's yeah enter the dragon and indiana jones and the temple of doom is pro- he's probably most recognized yes. for uh, lao che in the opening scene yeah because he's sort of more lengthy dialogue sequence in Enter the Dragon was cut than it was put back in years later, wasn't it? Yeah. And it was also used in, like, Game of Death 2, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like butchering Bruce Lee's kind of <laughs> movies for exploitation, you know? He, he, I think he's great, though, and he, he really adds a bit of weight to all this stuff that, yeah. that, it, that it could do with. And I also like, I really like the way that they don't, that whole training sequence, they don't overplay the ninja stuff. Because Frank Jukes is technically a ninja. Technically, this is a ninja movie. but And it's and it was made in 1986, right at the height of the ninja boom. And, you know, they just they just ignore that fact completely. They don't even use the word ninja in the movie. It's I think that's great. It's, you know, it completely separates it from that fad. Yeah. 
makes it its own thing. Otherwise, it would, you know, it would just been folded up into the whole ninja thing. I think it ran the risk of being. Well, this was shot in like October, wasn't it, of eighty six? I, I believe. think so. Yeah. I, I tried to find the filming dates when it started and finished. There's no sort of finished date I could find. But it must it must have been a four week shoot, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, do you know what it was? I've got that here. It was a forty two day shoot. Forty two days. Forty two days. I was shocked. That's why I made a note of it. I didn't realise that. Man. Forty two day shoot, and because the, they they actually took time over the. You know, they're in Hong Kong, so I assume that they were using a largely Hong Kong crew for the fights. You know, for the the shooting of the fight scenes. The, the stunt men and so on. I, I know a lot of the, I mean, the, in fact, these two guys here, um, John Chung and uh, I can't remember the other guy's name. These are both regulars on the Hong Kong circuit. You know, they they will have been beaten up by Jackie Chan more times than they can count. <laughs> they they just do they do things properly in Hong Kong when it comes to shooting a fight scene. They'll spend days over it. And I know the I, I read an interview with um, the guy who plays Paco. Um, so no, Paolo Torsha. Yes. And he was saying his fight, the fight he'd had with Van Damme, which is one of the last fights in the Kumite, they spent five days on. Wow. Okay. Which is... Because Hollywood generally was like one day, you get one yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it would have been... When I saw this as a kid, <laughs> I thought this was Street Fighter 1, <laughs> being an idiot. Um, because, you know, when Street Fighter 2 came out, I never heard of Street Fighter 1. I thought, what's his, what's his first game? And I thought this was it, but this was actually, you know, Karate Champ. Karate Champ, yeah. Yeah, which you control by just like, there's no buttons, you just use the sticks for kick, punch, and moving back and forth. And um, we threw a, a clip of this into my Street Fighter 2 documentary because it was just like the perfect way to demonstrate Karate Champ. Yeah. Was, oh, Bloodsport featured it. There you go. <laughs> and this is a great scene as well. There's. There's so, there's, the humour in this movie is the is the best it, it, uh, in any Van Damme movie. I think it's not over the top. It's just there are just a few little looks and like Van Damme's expressions here. His, his actual acting here is good. Yeah, it's you know it's just the right tone. It's it's light and it's you know the, the literature's fantastic little nuggets, especially <laughs> from Lynn later on. Uh, the what does it matter if Bruce Springsteen is his Shitoshi guy? Oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Everything yeah. he says is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. His tracksuit, like uh, trousers and stuff, <laughs> outfit. Well, Donald Gibb, you know, who plays Jackson, you know, he he was d- deployed to be this kind of muscle guy who was funny, mm. you know. So he was on, he was in Revenge of the Nerds, you know. That's yeah. what kind of made him kind of well known. Ogre. Yeah. Nerds that he's like in the film it was a great gif of him or meme, um, but he's yeah I I you know look at his R D B he still gets quite a bit of work you know throughout the eighties yeah. and nineties, and he's in quite a few H B O kind of promos and stuff so he was, you know wasn't this kind of guy just popped up playing random supporting characters he did have prominent roles and stuff but in his early stuff he was like uncredited in like Conan the Barbarian I don't know oh, really where he what he played in that must have been just a heavy in the background or one of them um... because he's not he's not enormous is he I mean, Van Damme is not a tall man so that helps I think but he's I, I, apparently 6'4 which is my height so you know too tall but not yeah necessarily <laughs> your your traditional <laughs> hulking whatever in in a movie <laughs> well that way but he's not he can't. He can't be six four because Van Damme is quite short, isn't he? You know, um, I don't know if that's a. I'm sure he must be. I'm sure Donald is shorter than six four. I love this guy. He's. He's. I can't remember his name now, but he's a um, assistant director, and didn't really act an awful lot. They just thought you. You look like a fun little chap to put in this scene with these two. <laughs> He's Asian Cliff Richard. It's like Cliff Richard in the eighties. You know? Watch his beard. Actually, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but his beard comes and goes to quite a dramatic extent. <laughs> oh, amazing! I just love how Van Damme's trousers are a bit too high. He's gone. He's gone, <laughs> he's gone full Simon Cowell, hasn't he? In this, he loved those high trousers, though, didn't he? He did. because he can do his kicks really high. Then, can't he? This is I, I'm I'm fascinated by Hong Kong and Hong Kong history up up to a point because of the, because of the movies they made there, and th- this is one of the only I think this might be the only Western movie ever to shoot here, in what was known as the, the Walled City, 
don't know if you know anything about it, but the history of this place is extraordinary. It's uh, on, main, main, on the mainland side of Hong Kong, in Kowloon Bay. And there were, I think, 35,000 people um, living in what was essentially the equivalent of a block that had just been built on and built on and built on and built on and built on. And the, the, the completely, the, the British authorities who ran Hong Kong at the time completely lost control of it for the, the entire century. It was run by the triads. There was no, you know, no police could, could enter, no one could do anything. And in order to, this, one of the reasons I would love to speak to Newt Arnold about how this got made is you didn't make any movie in Hong Kong without doing a deal with the triads. You, you had to. Oh. So the deal that they must have done with the triads to get in here must have been extraordinary. And I know that the triads insisted on stacking production, foreign productions, with their own people, basically, just in gopher roles or teamsters or whatever. So I suspect... I presume some of the audience as well who are watching Exactly, the yeah. I think most of the audience and I think some of the fighters are probably active triads. It's the only... It's the only possibility. Well, we haven't mentioned much of Newt Arnold. Obviously, he, he passed away a couple of years. No, I think it's like two thousand. I think it was he passed away. Um, but he, you know, he was a well-known, like basically assistant director. Mm. He worked on massive movies. Yeah, didn't he? Godfather Part Two, War Games, um, Blade Runner, The Goonies. You know, and he saved a few movies for Canon. Basically, just coming in at the last minute to shoot them or maybe as an assistant director taking taking over as a director um so it'd be interesting to know what the original edit was because we were discussing this before recording because it was famously yeah they'd shot it obviously late 86 this film has no big big visual big visual effects or, or optical work so it didn't get released till the first quarter of 1988 throughout the world so it's sort of starting in the usa and makes its way across Europe into Asia. Um, so it sat on the shelf for a while. So the, the direct, the editor, sorry, who had worked on things like um, Towering Inferno and um, a, a lot of TV stuff as well, but it obviously must have done a, a pretty bad job with this martial arts film. Maybe it just wasn't his forte. And um, obviously had an, an, an editor, doctor basically come in and re-edit the film, and Van Damme to supervise the fight sequences. Obviously, Van Damme wanted to try and save it because he, you know, Menachem was going to just shelve it and not put it out there. Well, exactly, and and he really did save it as well because it was. I mean, as you mentioned before, before yeah, that Menachem Golan did, did not like Van Damme at all. He, th- he thought he was poison. He thought he was going to go nowhere. He, he thought this movie was terrible. The original cut by Carl Carl Cress was apparently dreadful and he was more than happy to just shelve it and leave it apparently it was you know this 1.5 million budget it's pretty cheap even by canon standards but van damme was just beyond determined as he always was yeah it was his determination that got him the role in the first place and he kept pushing and in the end he convinced whoever whoever it was in, in authority at the time to let him have a, a crack at it and yeah, um, God, what's his name? Um, Michael J. Duthie, the sort of equivalent of Newt Arnold, really. Complete talent, but the kind of guy you bring in to solve a problem. So Michael J. Duthie recut the movie and Van Damme recut the fight scenes. And that's how they worked. And this was the result. And it, also Van Damme, even, but even after that, Golan apparently was uninterested. So it was Van Damme and Michael Kesey, his childhood friend, who plays one of the one of the fighters in the movie. Yeah, they then went to various film festivals around Europe to try and sell it themselves. And the first two deals were done by them. Huh. that's amazing. I never knew that. Malaysia and France. Yeah, they were the, the first two sales they got. Well, the, the, the French would obviously, you know, enjoy that. Aussie and the Belgians as well. But, I mean, I always loved that sequence there. When he, as a kid, I was just like blown, blown away by him sort of destroying the bottom brick. Yeah. You know, something that Frank Dukes could really do. Yeah, it must be real. It looked real. <laughs> I've seen a clip of Frank Dukes doing it on some morning TV show, like back in back in the eighties. 
and the male presenter has obviously heard that he's full of shit. <laughs> the female presenter either doesn't believe it or hasn't heard and is amazed, and the, the dynamic's hilarious. My God. Well, there's, I, was, I was saying to Rob before the commentary, uh, Frank Dukes has his kind of martial arts school. You can find us a Facebook page for it. I mean, my friend had a bit of a chuckle because most of the um, students are all kind of overweight. I thought, oh, that's a bit odd for martial arts. People who are skilled in martial arts shouldn't be that fat, but there you go. Because it was a, there was an interesting discussion um, about um, sort of bogus or fake martial artists during the 70s after Bruce Lee had, had, hit, it, hit, had hit it big in the Western market or sadly he'd p- passed away. Everyone was obsessed with him. Everyone became obsessed with martial arts. Um, there's a documentary uh, from the 90s covered by the BBC. And it's kind of Kung Fu kind of a weekend or night. And uh, they talk to these kind of martial arts um, um, teachers uh, who run schools in, in throughout the UK. And they said during the 70s, many bogus schools had popped up with mm. people claiming to be martial arts experts in Kung Fu, karate, ninjutsu and all this stuff. And it was all fake. And people, you know, sort of ruined their reputation, the, the professionals, because these bogus ones were teaching people stuff incorrectly, not doing it properly, and making them use weapons and nunchucks and size and throwing discs and stuff. And uh, and I think, really, uh, Frank Dukes kind of falls into that. Oh, completely, yeah. It's kind of a fantasist. He's blatantly one of these people, and it's still a big thing now, exposing fake martial arts masters uh, is a big thing on YouTube. Yes. And it's just so palpably obvious that these are damaged people who see something they think is cool, uh, maybe when they're teenagers, maybe younger, maybe older, and just decide, well, I'm going to just be that. I'm going to say I'm that. And without doing any training, exactly. Yeah, without know. without doing or without with doing only minimal training, you know, vastly exaggerated. Because Frank Dukes can, you know, he can kick someone in the head if he needs to. So he's obviously done something. He's he's not a complete amateur, but exagger- wildly exaggerating and getting completely carried away with, and inevitably comparing yourself to. Because all these people met Bruce Lee at some point, and all these people taught Bruce Lee something. Every one of them is extraordinary. Wait, well, it's like Steven Seagal said he knew Bruce Lee. Yeah. It's like, no, no, he didn't. You know, there's so much evidence out there to suggest he didn't. Seagal's another one of these people that uh, I, I, I genuinely believe Seagal's a legit Aikido master. But that doesn't mean he isn't also full of shit. And, you know, he obviously is. And it's so much, so it's also similar as well. Like the CIA thing is so common amongst these people. They were all recruited by the CIA at some point. Yeah, yeah. Both yeah. Dukes and Seagal. Dukes claims that he he was brought he was hired by the CIA to oh god he, he had a, he had a number of missions. He was referred to as America's super weapon by the CIA for one thing, <laughs> which I notice is actually a line in the trailer for Bloodsport. Ah, yes. The voiceover trailer refers to Frank Dukes as America's super weapon. Um, yeah, no, he was recruited. He claims he was recruited by the CIA to blow up a chemical weapons plant in Iraq. <laughs> that's, Fucking hell. That's just not true, is it? Frank Dukes to quest for peace, you know. He also, his favourite story that I've heard is that um, he, the, the sword that, um, that the Duke's character wins at the end of the Kumite was apparently, a, that, that was real. Apparently, he was, he was really awarded this like thousand year old samurai sword. And when he was asked to sort of produce it to, you know, as potential proof of the Kumite being real, he said he had to sell it because he was in, I think it was somewhere like Cambodia, and um, a bunch of orphans had been kidnapped by pirates, and the only way he could rescue them was by selling his Kumite sword. What? So he sold it. Something went wrong, so he didn't. He, he he couldn't use the money to buy their freedom. So he had to rescue them himself, in like a special ops mission, which he did successfully without any loss of life. God, well, it sounds like he's quite good at coming up with interesting stories. He could have been a proper scriptwriter, really, and sold more stories to canon because M- Menachem would have gone excellent. Well, exactly, Let's make yeah. that. You know, make four movies. He was almost the perfect partner for Menachem. Definitely. It's like Frank Dukes missing an action, you know. Um, 
Well, you mentioned that because Frank said he'd met Bruce Lee like he was yeah, cleaning his windows there's, or there's something. There's different versions of this story, but fundamentally, Frank Dukes, like like all young martial arts stars, he, he had to gain his training. He didn't have enough money to pay for training, so he would do odd jobs around dojos in exchange for, cha- for training. And the the version of the story I like best is that he was washing Bruce Lee's windows. Um, he hadn't been asked to do it. He wasn't being paid to do it. He was just trying to show keenness. He was washing Bruce Lee's windows, and Bruce saw him through the window, was amazed at his speed, and immediately brought him inside and questioned him on how he could get that fast himself. <laughs> Oh, God. It's, just, it's wonderful. Honestly, the interviews with this guy, they're just gold, all of them. Oh, they are, man. Oh, watch out, watch out for the boom mic down in the bottom right-hand corner here. It's one of the first boom mics I ever noticed as a child. It was sort of pan- Look at that! It just stuck <laughs> it right stuck in. It right in there. Oh, my God. <laughs> I suppose pan and scanned, yeah, you wouldn't have seen it originally in the VHS release. Yeah, it would have been punched in a bit, wouldn't it? Or well, unless it was an open mat, you know, you might have seen, you probably see more at the top, you know, of uh, other boom mics. That's you know. generally why there are so many boom mics in 4 by 3 movies, I think, at the top, because they were meant to be cropped out. That's all right, yeah. There, there is, okay, when it all kicks off, like, the, the sound mix comes in with the music, the sound effects. Me and my friend always notice, as a kid... The sound mix kind of weirdly has this cat meowing throughout <laughs> it with either the cheering. I, d- I don't know if you've ever heard that. It's this kind of, it's in the mix. Once you hear it, you can't, you can't ignore it. And we're always baffled. Like the guy who was doing all the sound effects had his cat somewhere in the background just meowing slightly. He just got picked it up in the mix. But if anyone listening who's also spotted that, uh, let me know in the comments. Uh, no beard. Lynn's beard had gone then. Oh, yeah. There's Michael Kesey. Yeah. Well, but, I refer to as Mohammed Kesey now, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, but he had... Uh, you see the guy next to him, like a boom, like a boom box, didn't he? Like a stereo blaster. Yeah. So he's probably like part of the triads, maybe. Yeah, like, I, I mean, they're, they're going to be... I mean, it's a $1.5 million Canon budget. They're not... These aren't hired extras. These are people from... The walled city, or people that the triads have forced on them. I, I, I'm, I would imagine. I'd bet money on it. Speaking of which, yeah, they're betting money. I love their notes; they're massive, aren't they? And it, oh, it's just—it's pure Street Fighter, isn't it? The, it is. The clear distinctions between each, like this is the guy who's Muay Thai, this is the guy who's Kung Fu, and so on. Yeah. And it's, it's unfortunate because I, you know, that Van Damme tried to capture this again with the quest, mm. and obviously had a falling out with Frank Dukes because they come up with the story mm. and um, they went to court and stuff. You can see it on on YouTube the whole video um, of their court case, and I mentioned it in my review of the quest. But me and my friend uh, Audi Surly had covered the quest on my channel, and we, you know, we saw at the time both both of us were just disappointed with how uh, the action was shot and a lot of kind of artificial slowing down the fights gave it a sort of juddery effect mm. and uh, and it's unfortunate because it, it, it does look the biz the, qu- the quest does it looks nice and um, it's just unfortunate the fight scenes just don't really have you know hadn't really modernised in a way for it to be really exciting and this that's exactly what it is yeah it's very 80s and 90s American fight scenes yeah yeah and it's unfortunate that a film from 10 years earlier really was looked far looked far superior you know uh, with its action yeah yeah, it's 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 a far cry from the Hong Kong style. I, I like both. I don't I don't think there's a right or a wrong, but I think in movies like The Quest, it's pushed too far, isn't it? The 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 speed ramping and the switching of angles in the middle, especially the slow motion, and your favourite in AWOL, the repeating of the of the impacts. You know, it's 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 called the double impact. They they a coined double it. Impact. You know, yeah. Which which it's, it, which uh, in Lionheart or AWOL, you know, they abuse a lot. You know, yeah. When um, Abdul Kissy kind of fights Van Damme at the end, one punch equals three. You know, or four. <laughs> you know, should add like combo counters on the screen. Yes. Three hit combo, <laughs> four hit combo. You know, I love that bit there where where the guy's back to face off he just goes asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
He's getting a deck in and suddenly just like uh, knocks him out in one punch. Because he can do a kick. This is a... I, this, like I was saying earlier, you, you, you've got the complete spectrum of talents here. And this guy, clearly a, a Western... They, I know they were desperate to, for, for Western martial artists. Because they didn't yes. want... They wanted it to look international. They didn't want everyone to, to have an Asian appearance. And he's obviously just some guy they've roped in who can, who can kick. He can do a kick. But he's not a fighter. He's, he's clearly not, it's not... Not Jackson, the guy. He's just flawed. He obviously wasn't a fighter. He was obviously exactly the kind of guy that all the ninja movies used. Just, you look like a westerner. You can lift your leg. You'll do. Well, he's just like... He, he kind of symbolizes that kind of like um, American, kind of average American. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Where they're sort of lovable, um, but they're a little bit kind of, a little bit stupid, but they're just, <laughs> it's, but they're just sort of, um, they're there for comedy, but they have the strength. They're not really skilled in the martial arts, essentially. He's kind of a wrestler, but they don't really deploy him to be a wrestler. Jackson, they, Jackson himself, you mean? Yeah. 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 Um, but he, he does have one of the best bits of dialogue at the at the opening of the movie. The guy's like the guy who comes up to him. He's also the I think the producer of Kickboxer. Yes. Um, yeah. Because he pops up in uh, Kickboxer it's, as it's well. The producer a, of this. Yes, because he went. He used to make uh, porn films. <laughs> and then he went into making martial arts films. Ma- he saw Mark a market there. I think it's that's it. Mark Desal, yeah. 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 Um, oh, oh I love this little moment here because this is a throwback. Obviously, a joke. Because it's like Bolo versus Bruce Lee. Yeah. He's doing all the Bruce Lee kind of posing. He gets his arms and whoops, you know. And there's a lot of references to Enter the Dragon in this as well. Not just, obviously, the oh, casting yeah. of Bolo, but a lot of the uh, camera angles and so on, and a lot of his moves are exact repeats from Enter the Dragon. And obviously the, the famous line that we, we, we talked over earlier, the brick not hit back line is... Yeah, yeah. That's, that's straight from Enter the Dragon bit with boards but I did um, as I was mentioning earlier with the the opening sequence with uh, Jackson when the guy's like oh you get killed in those things he goes only if you fuck up yeah. <laughs> it's like me and my friends like we just love Jackson all his lines are brilliant absolutely I break you like I break your friend <laughs> it, it's so quotable isn't it it's so, it's by far and away the most quotable of Van Damme's movies now I show you some trick or two. <laughs> <laughs> Makes chicks with bricks, you know. That's a great angle as well. There's some good stuff in this. Van Damme, you know, he really sells this. What is it? I mean, Scott Atkins, you know, who was, you know, a huge fan of huge fan of Van Damme and was inspired by him and and essentially become what Van Damme is, really. Mm. I mean, he's like even better than Van Damme. Yeah. His he's, skill. I, um, I think he's awesome, Scott Atkins. It's just unfortunate that Scott Atkins never hit the the fame level of as Van Damme being in like big A list films, you know, like Van Damme did with Universal. Yeah, you know, certainly leading them. Yeah, being the leading yeah, them. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's just too clear a delineation there, isn't it? It's it's going to be very hard, I think, going forwards for people like Scott Atkins to break into movies. That they used to get people like that used to be given like Under Siege or Time Cop, you know. Oh yeah, because if if Scott was that in his thirties in the early nineties, he would have been. Oh god, can massive, you imagine? I think because because the guy can act as well. He's yeah, like, he's, yeah. he's better than most. I, I think he's incredible. He is, yeah. And you know when he said, um, you know, once he saw Van Damme doing those kicks, he was like, I want to do that. Yeah, you know? and it's, it's it's interesting that how influential Van Damme was in that respect, and how many super fans there are of this movie. I watched the um, the commentary uh, last night on the special edition release, which I hadn't seen for you. I watched the commentary years ago when it came out, and I watched it again. Last night. And what I hadn't remembered or realised was that it's hosted by Jimmy Bennett. Do you, do you know that name, James P. Bennett? He's also known as he's an Irish martial artist he he's, rings about he's never been big he's, he's he's only been in small movies but he's one of those people who's um like absolutely made his dream career come true because he's he's in hong kong action movie he worshipped idolized van damme and now like adkins he's friendly with him and he hosts the podcast but what i know it's not the podcast the commentary but what i know him from 
is a movie called Fatal Deviation. Fatal Deviation, yes. That's so notorious, you, you must have yeah, heard yeah. of it. It's Ireland's first and maybe only martial arts movie. Oh, it's brilliant. And one of the best things you'll ever see. It's hilarious. <laughs> Shot on VHS by Jimmy Bent. I don't think he directed it, but he wrote it and stars in it. It's a proper vanity project. Wasn't it shot in like Limerick or something? Or Cork? Somewhere or something like, like that. that. Yeah. I can't remember. One of my friends kind of um, knew of what was going on at the time, you know. Oh, really? I love the, oh, the Thai guy. He's um, the martial, Thai martial artist. He's, um, yeah, that's Paolo Torshi. Yeah. yeah, that's right, because he pops up in... Doesn't he pop up in the Quest, or is he another Van Damme film he's I in? I think he's in a. He's in. Um, I've got oh a feeling he's in um, Death Warrant. Um, he might well be in Double Impact, and hmm. yeah, I think he might well be in the Quest. He's certainly in at least two of those three. I think. I absolutely love this music, Stan Bush. So good, isn't it? Oh, he's in, he's in that Van Damme film called In Hell, which is a great movie. Oh, One yeah. of his better movies of the later sort of period. It's in Predator 2. He's, yeah, he's, yeah, you're right, he's in Death Warrant. Yeah. I, th- I, th- I always thought he might have popped up in the quest, but he didn't. No. A lot of people from this, or a number of people involved in this, one way or another, did in the quest. Yeah. I think Forrest Whitaker's been interviewed quite a few times, and he's, people always mention Bloodsport, you know, to him. He's also Paolo Torsha in a in a whole, but he's the only one of the actors in this who's in a whole bunch of your classic cut and paste ninja movies that were being made around the same time as this. And he's in um, in Ninja Dragon. He goes under the name um, Bruce Stallion, <laughs> which I've always thought is one of the best <laughs> best AKAs possible. <laughs> And again, with the the writing and the and the humour, these two, Helmer and I've forgotten Forrest Whitaker's character's name now, but they're a beautifully conceived pair of characters. They they drive the plot. They give they're, they're comic relief. They yeah, yeah. they flesh out other characters. It's a really nice addition to the to the story. For for, for a film that could potentially have too many characters going on, with the editing and how it's written, it's nicely juggled. Exactly, Everyone gets gets enough screen time. Yeah. Yeah, and even the the way that all the competitors' identities are so clear as well, and even though they're not necessarily that... Like um, like Michael Kesey in this, or Mohamed Kesey, is supposed to be playing a Brazilian capoeira fighter. Mm. But I'm, I'm I'm not an expert on martial arts, but I know the difference between capoeira and kickboxing. Yes. And, and he's not doing capoeira. He's doing Muay Thai or kickboxing, one or the other. Well, yeah, it's like in Kickboxer, the movie. Van Damme is not doing Muay Thai <laughs> stuff. He's doing Van Damme martial arts, you know. Paolo Torsha, on the other hand, is doing Muay Thai and, yeah. uh, you know, properly and excellently. It's all, like, it's all with knees and elbows. Yeah, he's got it? his hands right up there. He, yeah, he's striking with his elbows and his knees, even when there's absolutely no reason to. But he, he wants to demonstrate how good his, his art is. But like the, the, the way that that character is drawn and defined, you know, he's got the Muay Thai shorts. It's the style is clear. Everything about that character, all that they're all like that. They're, you know, they've got half a dozen uh, Asian kung fu actors, and but their characters are all somehow clearly distinct. Yeah, oh, there's this little moment here with the musical montage, great song as well. But Van Damme also d- demonstrating that he can do comedy. Yeah, it's. Proper slapstick, yeah. not slapstick really, but sort of campy humour, and he's sort of like just playing with them. It feels like something out of a French film, you know what <laughs> I mean, or like something out of the sixties, you know. You see, I think it's brilliant this little moment. Yeah, this watch him grab this. He grabs that woman there. Yeah, I, I can't remember where I read it, but apparently he he was he just didn't realise she was going to be there and couldn't stop, <laughs> and had and had to grab her and ended up rolling with her and almost, <laughs> almost knocked her flying. <laughs> it isn't exactly this scene in um, Double Impact. I haven't seen Double Impact for 20-odd years, but I'm there sure a, they it, cross these boats in this same Yeah, spot. there is a, a, a similar sort of sequence, yeah. I mean, this is, again, shooting these kind of boats and all this stuff, it's sort of reminiscent of the opening sequence of Enter the Dragon. Yeah. You know, capturing that. It's catching the, capturing the energy 
of Hong Kong. Exactly, yeah, know? exactly. And this does it. This does it extremely well. And it was only shot here last minute, wasn't it? It was meant to be shot in Japan, and it was right. it was written to be shot in Japan, and in fact, I think I think it was literally at the last minute. Canon found a a cheaper deal in Hong Kong, mm, but stage rights probably. Yeah. Or the triads were more favourable in there, but the um, a lot of the a lot of the um, dialogue, like Kumite itself, is a is is a Japanese word. It's you know it's because it was originally meant to be a Japanese concept. The language associated with it, from Kumite to the words the referee uses to start and finish fights and so on, a lot of the writing, a lot of the signs, is um, is is all is Japanese. Also, you've got the, the love interest, um, Leah. Is it Leah Aries? Leah, Leah um, yeah, Ayres. Leah, Leah, yeah. Leah Ayres, something, yeah, something like that. But she's mostly TV, TV yeah, star. Yeah, um, I think the last thing she did was in, like, 1998, so... I've got a feeling she's... she's. If you look at her resume, it's the resume of someone who married someone wealthy, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the sort of woman who'd sort of be, like, a supporting character in, like, Dallas or, yeah. you know, something like that. Um, she was in. She did have a lead role in the burning. The yes, eighty one video nasty. But yeah, I think that's the only other significant thing I know her from. And of course, we got to see Van Damme's bum. Oh, is, oh get ready, get ready. <laughs> <laughs> These pants. It would be even funny if he was wearing a thong. Oh, that'd be hilarious. <laughs> don't don't joke about it. He's he's not old enough yet that he's. <laughs> Oh, I, do. I love this scene though as well because it's just there's no mucking about. There's there's no awkward three minutes of his ass bouncing up and down on her. And it's, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's they cut straight. They know they know no one's interested. They cut straight from the bit they have to have to the other bit that they have to have, and, uh, and that's it. Yeah, exactly. Well, Canon were quite like that. They didn't really. I mean, their earlier films, they deployed a lot of nudity, but later on they didn't really mm. do that. I think they were very, somewhat kind of mindful yeah. of like what their audience kind of want and the markets as well, because you've got to be like quite careful, I think, with sort of things like that. Ah, oh, great little romantic melody, synth theme, as it were. And she understands, she knows that her man has to go and kick people in the head now. <laughs> Gotta go break a few skulls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just love him, don't you? Oh, dear. My dad hates Van Damme. <laughs> you know, when he, he when he came to the premiere of um, my action documentary, and he goes, Oliver, 10 out of 10, but way too much Van Damme. <laughs> <laughs> Hates him. I don't know why. What's what's the beard doing in this scene? Oh, it's, it was a kind of a stubble. It's, still it's, there. it's, yeah, stubble. it's, it's as if he decided to to grow a beard during filming. <laughs> Every scene, it's a different length. It should. It'd be great if it's like a massive beard one shot. Then none, there's nothing. You know. <laughs> For you. Because <laughs> none of these guys really are... And I've not looked up everyone in this movie, but most of the people who you would expect to be regular actors in, in Hong Kong don't have any other credits, which, again, really leads me to think they're triads. <laughs> Everyone's triads in Rob's book. Yeah. They've got to be, they've gotta be cr- criminal. Especially her. Got, they've they got to be. <laughs> yeah. Look at their hair. So eighties. Like this, uh, Van Damme in this. I thought this when I rewatched this the other day. I was thinking, Van Damme's acting in this scene is brilliant. His reactions, <laughs> I should say, it's. it's, it's tells he's you the, he's bloody good at reactions. He's really good at that. Or well, just sort of staring people down. He's good at that as well. Yeah, me and my friend Audie are just like the number of Van Damme comedies we've done. We're just always impressed with how he holds himself on camera and emotes and things like that. <laughs> Does it well? He does. Where, where Arnold doesn't quite have that range, no. he's just either <laughs> looks at you like he's going to kill you, or he's just like, oh, just like confused, you know. 
I was I always resented the way that Arnold and Stallone were compared because I always thought Stallone was a genuinely good actor. Or could it's be anyway. extremely extremely bright, isn't he, Stallone? Very Allegedly, high IQ, yeah. apparently. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he, you know, he was always kind of yeah, kind of downplayed by critics for being a bit stupid and stuff. Down to uh, sort of judgmental. He's he's always seemed to try very hard though to 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 appear. Though, have you read that um, Nick DeSemian book that, uh, that? No. He stole the title for the Last Action Heroes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've not read it. Was it a good book? I mean, I, I know because when it was announced on Twitter, uh, one of the producers uh, messaged me and goes, "Ollie, this is a very similar title." I went, "Yeah, well, yeah." And the guy was like, "Yeah, I, I've seen the documentary. It's very, really, very good." And um, yeah, I've not, I've not purchased it as of yet. I got it. Santa brought it for me, and it's, it's really quite good. I'm not surprised. He's, 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 he's a good writer. Yeah, yeah. But he talks a lot about that about Stallone's. Um, the difference between Stallone and Schwarzenegger, basically, in how Stallone just decided that he was going to craft his mind in the same way that he crafted his body, and it it, it just remind it reminded me just of how how sort of contrived it almost seemed Stallone's decision that he's going to become an intellectual. But yeah, I mean, he, he probably <laughs> is just really bright and had no obviously had very little education and until he had the opportunity to see what the world had to offer, he probably didn't know what he wanted to be filling his head with. Well, his recent documentary about him on Netflix isn't very good. No, I've not seen that. It's, um, he's, he executive produced it, so he's in control of what... Oh, it's not that reality programme, is it? Of what the, no, not reality thing, no. Because uh, he controls the narrative, so there's a lot missing about his history in that. Um, his relationships with, like, you know, Bridget Nielsen and... His mother's not mentioned, and uh, and uh, his politics and things like that. Mm. It's all missing. Where Arnold's documentary, which is four episodes, covers everything, and um, you know he's not afraid to, you know, talk about his his fuck ups, basically. I love that. Have you ever thought about how ridiculous that is? The report trying to record that, so all these people she, screaming. It's like, you know but what I mean but the well. thing is, she's trying to do it secretly because she's not allowed because she's undercover. Exactly, but she's like so. Therefore, you can kind of understand a photographer needing to sneakily take a. Fo- but why do you need to sneakily make a note when you're get a notepad? <laughs> just, just remember. <laughs> just remember. <laughs> Write it afterwards. <laughs> why is? How can no one have noticed that? I love how Bolo just goes for the kill every time. He's not going to make them survive. Just break their neck. These guys, I always think these guys look like the real business. I wouldn't want to get into a fight with either of them. You could, Rob, you could probably pick up that short guy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just hold him at arm's length, couldn't you? You know, he's quite quite small. <laughs> so small. It's all one shot there. Yeah, That's good. It's, it's like... not, they're not cutting. That's good. And this is good as well. This is this is great because the guy just like I'm like you know I'm going to kill you sort of attitude. A fan tab knocks him down in one kick. <laughs> Love it. So again, this is this is real acting from Van Damme. Reacting. I know he's just standing there expressionless, but in four four or five movies' time, he wouldn't be doing that. He'd be doing something stupid. <laughs> So you don't even see in many Van Damme films where he just does a roll forward mm. and jumps up and kicks. He just doesn't even do that, you know. There's kind of things like doing like sudden death when you, which is one of my favourite Van Damme films. It's one of the best Die Hard clones, and um, that's doing his coke phase. You mm. see, so some of the stunts where which Van Damme could have done them himself, he's got a stunt double. When you see it in high definition, you're like, whoa, that's a bit. That ain't Van Damme. That's yeah. a stunt man, <laughs> you know. There's a whole family of movies, especially from you know, the early 80s and 90s, that we're so, we watched on VHS growing up, and we're now seeing HD and noticing just how little the main characters in it, Nor- Chuck Norris movies in particular, is so often doubled. Really? And he, 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 even, he's, he's, he's quite old, even well, by that this point. This is it, yeah. He was, he was getting on 
you know, he was well into his 40s before, mm. you know, in the, in the early 80s. This guy's a, a weird... I've got no idea why he's in this. His, his name's um, the, the blonde guy. He's normally got dark hair, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost... It's like Bay Logan. ...suspicious that, that there's, he's been... Well, he does, actually, doesn't he? Yeah. I'm almost suspicious that he's been miscredited everywhere because he's, he's, not, he's, he's an Iranian actor who's... I was saying John Gaffari or Garafi, who's in loads of Turkish B-movies in the 70s and 80s. He's, he's often getting beaten up by my hero, Junita Arkin. Well, he's, he, he, I presume his character was like a Aikido. Yes, yeah, he was meant to be Aikido. Yeah, it's kind of like Geese Howard from Fatal Fury game. And this guy... He Honda here. <laughs> well, this guy apparently isn't meant to be sumo. He's meant to be like um, some sort of Tongan wrestler type, you know, slightly different to sumo. Really? Which does make sense because he isn't, you know, he doesn't look like a sumo, does he? Sumos aren't built like that. That's true. That's true. Yeah, because we, but as a kid or a teenager, you're observing it. It's going from what you base your, what you're familiar with. You just go, oh, that looks like a yeah, sumo. Yeah, of course. Guy. Yeah, he's yeah. sumo guy. That's what I always assumed. But, I mean, also, he doesn't do the, unless I'm misremembering, he doesn't do the sumo stamp thing or the the salt no. thing or, you know, any of their ritualistic stuff. Here we go, slow-mo. <laughs> oh, love that. Yeah. Obviously, because famously, Mortal Kombat was inspired by Bloodsport and they wanted to make a, a game based around Van Damme. He wouldn't, they couldn't get the license, he wasn't interested. Um, but they basically... Created Johnny Cage, who was Van Damme, and Johnny Cage does the splits, yeah, and not punches you in the balls, <laughs> whack. But then Van Damme would come back to Mortal Kombat. Well, would take part in Mortal Kombat as a DLC or a character you can download for the most recent Mortal Kombat How is game, that and so? he and he's in the uh, Bloodsport outfit. Is he? So you can be. Yes, there's a reason to buy it. I've got. I've <laughs> got some modern. Mortal Kombat game that I play with my son. I didn't know that. If, if it's the new one, uh, he's in that. I think. Oh. Yeah. But obviously, we, we, all, we all know Van Damme was in Street Fighter, so he did take part in a video game. You know. Yeah, and he's also in the past claimed that um, Guile was based on him too in Bloodsport, which <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> I know Van Damme was annoyed though that he was copied. Uh, by Mortal Kombat. Well, yeah, Mortal Johnny Kombat. Cage. Fine, but Mortal Kombat, I mean, I, I'm not a Street Fighter expert. I don't know if there's one around, but I'm fairly sure it predates Bloodsport, doesn't it? Uh, just... the, the, character, the character Guile come, was, was Street Fighter 2 is 1991, so it was. Oh, okay. Bloodsport was before, but there was no, ev- there's no evidence to suggest that Guile was uh, inspired by, by Van Damme. Um, I know things like Ken. Ken was inspired by things like Benny the Jet, because Benny the Jet wore red. A lot right, in his yeah. kind of fights, he took he took part in in Japan and things like that. Um, yeah, he's such an idiot. <laughs> I know, yeah. This I always think this bit goes on just a little bit too long. It's just yeah. It's like I've beaten the end boss. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's got a little bit of energy left. He's gonna get you. He runs a um, bar and a brewery in Chicago now. The Does Don he? Gibb, yeah. Oh, amazing. Apparently, once a month, he makes sure to do the rounds and go around greeting people. and That would be pretty cool. That would be sweet. Especially if he was dressed Cause... like that. <laughs> you have to get him to say a line from Bloodsport, you know. Oh, I'm sure he would. There's so many lines to use, really. It's really the, the, this raised stage platform that they fight on. It, it does provide all kinds of interesting opportunities, doesn't it? It's a really good idea. But they use it really well in terms of camera angles. Yeah, because it really helps. Um, because you've got that height, you can put the camera quite low, and it still it gives everyone you know a bit of a lift, and it's sort of you get that sort of good, you know, looking up at them yeah. sort of angle. And I, I love the way, I, just the fact it gets bloodier and bloodier as the tournament goes on. That was so striking as a youngster watching this. <laughs> this whole thing, this scene in general feels a bit like, uh, well, we need to give him some more motivation. 
So what can we yeah. do? And I'm not sure it really earns it. Rocky Two moment, isn't it, or something? You know, Rocky Two is a weird one as well, where Adrian just goes into a coma because <laughs> all the stress and at the end just wakes up and just goes go fight. Like, right, okay, and it's like that whole month, the whole bit which is in a coma just drags out. Yeah, Rocky Rocky Two's got some problems. I mean, they've known each other for two days. It must be. Like uh, they're the best friends. Yeah. The logical thing would have been to do something horrible to her, but I suppose that would have been that would have taken the much. film in a different direction. But it's a little bit like uh, with Kickboxer, following the similar beats. But Kickboxer has the sort of you know, his brother get taken out very early in the film. Um. Thus, it sort of gives him the motivation. Where this, he's already has, he's always got his own motivation anyway to avenge, you know, avenge his um, sort of best friend, I suppose. In and uh, but really, his motivation to begin with is to honour his Shidoshi. That's what he's always yes. saying at the start, isn't it? It's yeah, what, possibly because he's but his son though, who was essentially his best yeah, friend. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, kind of, yeah, 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 was killed. Shingo. I don't think we ever yeah. hear his. I'm not from here, is it? Yeah, which you never see him as an adult, so you just see him in the flashbacks as a kid and all that awkward acting. You know? Yeah, and his death's never explained either. It's just no. It's just because Bodo killed him. Appar- well, maybe. Yeah, well, that would have been a hokey, hokey as hell if it had been implied that Bolo had had killed. Well, he's the reigning champion, so he must have done, right? Well, you know, I, I, you know, I'd never thought about that. So you're, so you're. You're thinking Shingo went to the, the the son went to the Kumite first and, and was killed yeah. by. I'm sure he was. I'm sure I don't. That's... I don't know because um, there's a deleted scene in which uh, which has never been released, but it was shot apparently, in which um, uh, Dukes tells her that um, Shingo was killed in a car accident. Oh. And but then there but there was another theory. I remember, I can't. What was it? There was another theory that did, that did the rounds. But yeah, that would have been that would have been a a much more powerful motivation to add. But well, yeah, that's, that's what I thought. Oh. They'd have to have explained it a bit more though. And I think I think it would have to have been a slightly more personal thing between Dukes and Chong Lee when they first meet and so on. Him just dying in a car crash isn't that's a bit weird. Like. And exactly, isn't it? It's as just, motivation. It's, yeah, it's really just kind of vague and pointless. And oh, it was something to do with the war. That was it. There was. It was originally meant to be that he was killed in in Vietnam or in in a war or something. Yeah, I love his little montages. Sometimes I do it in movies where I have flashbacks to things they weren't privy to, or like <laughs> see, you know. But it kind of keeps it to stuff where Van Damme was present, you know. I'm, I'm constantly waiting for the opportunity to use that shot as well. I love the, the bit where he sees Chong Lee in the reflection. Oh, yeah, that bit's great. I'm, yeah. I'm waiting for an opportunity to be making a video in which someone is having like a daydream or something on a bus, and I can just show <laughs> that, throw that shot in and see if anyone notices. Oh, you got to do it, man, yeah. That's up on Victoria Peak, That's, and, and so is that, I think. It definitely is, yeah. I mean, what a view! Look at that. That's amazing, isn't it? He's got to do the splits, of course. <laughs> you know. You imagine the you can't get vertigo. I wouldn't be able. To, I wouldn't be able to walk out on that balcony, let oh, alone. Oh, I could do that, but I couldn't. Like, I don't know. The thought of just leaning over and looking, I'd be like, Ugh. <laughs> oiled up. <laughs> I don't know what the. I don't know what these kind of. Uh, movements with his arms, what he's doing, like what is this? You know, I often wonder that as well. Is this stuff that Frank Dukes has taught him? Because <laughs> just, allegedly or apparently, nonsense. a lot, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff. There's a bit he does with his fingers. Um, I think it's actually in the in the Kumite, which, and I know that he was taught that by Dukes. So I suspect all of this is Dukes's teachings, and therefore probably just made up bullshit. <laughs> That should be the tagline for Bloodsport. <laughs> Bloodsport. <laughs> All made up bullshit. <laughs> these little touches are great. I love these. What's he laughing about? <laughs> sucky, sucky, five dollar? <laughs> <laughs> Sucky, 
And it's all, oh, it just it just all works, doesn't it? They, they've they've all these characters have been established perfectly in just the way they should have been. They've had just the right amount of screen time. They're clearly defined. So, you got Philip Chan as well, you know, as yeah. the um, does it as it the sergeant or um, the, or captain well, or something? Yeah, like it would have still been a. They've done stuff like you know, hard boiled police story three, you know. It's like in a lot of those, you know, because Hong Kong, obviously under British rule, you know, had a lot of actors, you know, speak English. Yeah. So it sort of gave them sort of more opportunities, more jobs. Yeah. I, I believe that, yeah, back in the 80s, pretty much everyone in the Hong Kong film industry spoke English. And now, apparently, it's very, very different. Yeah, I think um, I think maybe a lot of people in Hong Kong probably wish the British still ruled and they're not particularly happy with China <laughs> taking over. nice that there's one small part of the world that thinks like that rather than, <laughs> rather than just having nothing but horrible memories of imperial rule. <laughs> what did he... He went on to do the odd thing, didn't he? The guy in the middle. Oh, Norman Bunton. You mean Forrest Whitaker? Oh, Forrest. Oh, sorry. I don't think we've actually mentioned him, have we? But we mentioned a little bit of Forrest, you know. But he's, yeah, he went and came to a big star, didn't he? You know, a lot, of, a lot of big films. You know, I always remembered him from Species as a kid, Oscar or a teenager, winner. really. Yeah, he's an Oscar winner, yeah. Wait, obviously, there is it Last King of Scotland, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it must have been. Yeah, it's funny. I, I still think of him first. I think of Bloodsport. <laughs> <laughs> kind of embarrassing. <laughs> If you saw him, blood sport, you'd be like, you'd be like, oh god. <laughs> you, know? you know it happens to him at least once a week as well. Of course, if he's in a genre favourite, you know, uh, a a cult classic. I mean, you could, I, I don't think you can even call blood sport a cult classic. It's beyond that, really. Yeah, it is now, yeah. A, a cult classic is something that I mean, Bruce Campbell kind of always said. It's like a cult classic is a film watched by one person a thousand times. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But it, back in the day, it was much uh, the secondary movie to Kickboxer, at least in my awareness and circle of friends. It was very much seen as a lesser sibling to Kickboxer and AWOL or Lionheart. Right. Well, was, well at the time, this was a massive hit. So I suppose it's down to, yeah, it's a different experience for, you know, different demographics and uh, each country, you know. It was palpably cheaper and rough around the edges than Kickboxer and AWOL, which when yeah, you're yeah. that age, maybe that's, maybe you think of that. Yeah, he encouraged you to put his, to put his hands up. It's all, it's all, it's all a trick. <laughs> oh, oh, nice. And it's, uh, it's the first time he, uh, he's been cut, I believe. And it's if you notice, it's on the other. It's it's his right eye that's cut, but it was his left eye that was struck. Oh, continuity gaff there! <laughs> you made me bleed my own blood. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, five days this fight took to film. And it's, you know, it's it's probably the the best fight Van Dam has actually because it's like Van Dam's speed as well when he does um, encourages him to kick him in the, yeah. in the side. And you can see that they're making contact as well. It's no, they're not. Well, most of the time. In the um, in the last Kumite, there's a little throwback sequence to this as well. <laughs> a, a, a kick off, as it were. <laughs> <You know? laughs> this bit here, Van Dam does That's like whack. Brilliant. It's so quick. Absolutely brilliant. I love that kick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My friend Chris always does. He's always good at doing Arnold impressions, but when it comes to Van Damme, it's always just a <laughs> sort of sound. See, I love the way we're, we're sort of watching these fights. One thing Newt Arnold does really well, unless it was done in the editing, is give us um, observers to experience things through. Like, we, we just saw Helmer and Forrest Whitaker kind of being shocked and amazed at how good 
Van Damme's character actually is. And yes. we see her explosion of joy when he wins. We see Chong Lee's kind of like the look on his face which says, shit, I thought I, thought I might be getting an easier opponent, but I am going to have to deal with him. And yeah. the, way, the way they're cut in is, is just perfect. And we experience, it adds so much to our experience because we feel those reactions. It's just more sort of development to those characters as well. And we, we now, yeah, saying, seeing the authorities, you know, who are after Van Damme now begin to like get get involved and yeah. get excited and and, uh, and realize that you know they need to let him do what he needs to do. Crack! Oh. I mean, I think Bolo is actually more terrifying in like um, double impact. He's proper like because he's got like the um, scar mm. down his face and his eyes gone white. You know, he's lost sight in that eye, I think. And um, yeah, he's such a great sort of like henchman in that. I haven't seen Double Impact since since back at, literally back in the day when it came out on video. Oh, probably, dude, you got you got to watch it again. It's so much fun. I had one of those six foot cardboard cutouts. You know, the stands that they used to have in Did you? I, had, I had one of those Double Impact. It's the the image of Chad and Alex. Is it? I think. So yeah, like is it like the back, side? Like, yeah, 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 back to back. Yeah. You know, that's that's an amazing poster. That is. I'd love to get an original quad poster of that. Weirdly and completely randomly, I went to the a cast and crew screening of Double Impact as well. I must have been about, I think, I must have been fourteen, something like that. What? And a, some family friend. I don't know how she, what her connection was, but some family friend had a couple of tickets to a cast and crew screen. Knew I was a Van Damme fan. And I remember going up, going up there on uh, on the weekend one morning. What was it in London? Yeah, it was in London, yeah. And it yeah, was, there yeah. wasn't, to be honest, it wasn't. It turned, it was half empty, and it there was no one like major from the movie there. I imagine it would have been like a press screening then. It maybe it maybe was, or? maybe it would have been a press screening. I remember it had cast and crew on the ticket, but maybe it would have been largely press, or if not, probably you just might a, have had um, one of the because Vic Armstrong. Did the stunts and his brother as well helped out? I think second. I was going to say if there's some if there was a British company involved somewhere, then they'll have put on a, a, a screening for them, and it will only have been the handful of people involved in whatever. Yeah, because Vic Armstrong's brother plays Chad's and Alex's dad. Oh, uh, really? In the film at the beginning, oh, I shot. didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I did review the film, <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen it as well. So I obviously don't remember that. I remember some of the facts. Sometimes I just forget what I've said. It's like I've had people approach me and go, and go, Ollie, I remember when you said this about the film. Yeah. But I don't remember <laughs> yes, saying any exactly. of that. <laughs> what, some seven years ago. I've been caught out a couple of times on stage in front of a small audience of some sort. Being like, yeah, oh, yeah, this story that you told was brilliant. What is it now? Tell it. Um. <laughs> I can't remember what happened last week, let alone seven years ago. That's it. You become a, an expert in what you're making a video on while you're making the video, don't you? And then you kind yes. of, a lot of it leaves your mind. It does. You move on to the next one, you know. I'm certainly looking forward to, to forgetting an awful lot about ninjas. <laughs> What's a ninja again? <laughs> <laughs> Who's Chuck Norris? <laughs> oh, he's going to put the um, powder or whatever it is. He crunches up like a... Like a giant paracetamol, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> he just well, throws it in his eyes. Well, apparently it's salt, and it's referred to as that in the in the script. Okay. I I always wondered what it was as a child, and watching this with my son the other day, I, I he, he said, "What's that?" And I, and I said, "Oh, it's it's salt." And he said, "But but if you get salt in your eye, it doesn't sting that badly, does it?" And it's a really good point, actually. <laughs> salt isn't that. <laughs> Yeah, if he goes in, if he if he puts a lot of it in his mouth, he'd be like, "Oh, I'm so I'm parched, I'm so dry." You know, did your son enjoy it though? He loved it. Yeah, yeah. Good. He's <laughs> you know, he's only ten, but yeah, he loved it. Perfect age, isn't it, to see a Van Damme film? I think it is. Despite yeah. them being eighteen rated, when you're ten years old, they're like the best thing. Yeah, it's compared to your average Marvel movie. The Cape Lights put out a great remaster of Bloodsport recently, the 4K one. Which I, which I yeah, I picked up the German release when it came out. Then it, I didn't realise it was coming out in the UK like three months later. I was like, uh, <laughs> I did. Got, it's a great, great set though. I, I had a look at that for the um, for rewatching it again. I thought it's about time I bought the 
the dog's bollocks version of it, and it was, but it's so expensive at the moment. Yeah, it's 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 a pretty pricey title. Went back to my trusty DVD. <laughs> there you go, the poster. That's the kick. Look at that. Oh, look at that. I love that because he helps the referee as well. He's like he's such a good guy, you know. Playing by the rules. One of my friends who's a bit older than me, when we watched it um, as, as, as early teenagers, when Van Dam starts, when he gets blind and he starts doing those kicks towards him, like doing this sort of yeah, so, you know, like a, <laughs> yeah, like a, a windmill of kicks. <laughs> he was like, he was, he was pissing his pants with laughter. He goes, it's so silly. I've <laughs> never understood whether that's is that meant to be a a joke on. I don't <laughs> know what the joke's meant to be there. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like. Van Damme just showing off what he can do and then just going, yeah, that looks cool, do that. Just film it in slow-mo as well. A little bit he flies past camera, he's like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a good bit. It sounds like they're saying Chun-Li. Chun-Li, Chun-Li. It's Chun-Li, you idiot. And the crowd is moving about. It's like every now and again there's a shot and there's just a whole section of the crowd where there's no crowd. Uh, I don't think the, I don't think they'd necessarily pan it out that way to shoot from that angle. That's the famous shot from the trailer. We just a kick, and then and Paul Herzog's hero theme for Frank Duke's kick scene. It's so good, it's so like awe inspiring. You know, see, you never see Van Damme do that in films. No. He's doing a bit of proper somersault there. Look at that! Smell my feet. Look at that! That's a good kick. Oh. It's very modular, is it? I think, yeah, I think the the fight with um, the fight against Paco is probably better. It's this is so rigid and modular, and it's like, right, we have done this bit. Now we're going to do this bit. Now we're going to do this bit. You know, it doesn't. That's flow. kind of what frustrated me later on with Van Damme films. Yeah. He'd just do punch, punch, then a kick. I kind of wanted more from him as I got older because he didn't really evolve his fighting style. That's very true. We never saw him doing any sort of really elaborate blocking and like things like that, like you'd see from Jackie Chan because he's he's like a different style of martial arts where it's like it's all about the impact, like mm. doing the strongest punch and the, and the and the best kick to knock them down. Yeah. But very American style. It is, it is, and it's um, and but it's for the time it's fine, but as you as a if a martial arts fan like you, you and I, once you start seeing more Hong Kong stuff, you kind of want more. And once you, you want more from the Western movies, and they didn't really do that, mm. you know, until recently. Well, yeah, I mean, John is, Wick and stuff, is, I mean, you know, and well, The Matrix did a lot. I suppose, yeah, I suppose The Matrix, yeah. but it's still, I don't, know, the, the fight scenes in The Matrix are still a little more rigid and stiff than Young Wu Ping's. You know, Hong Kong movies. You could would say be. because they're not proper martial arts, it has to be. It's a little bit more telegraphed. You can kind of see it's a little bit slower. Yeah, that's yeah, that's probably the best way to put it. Yeah, a bit more telegraphed and a little slower. But yeah, now, I mean, what they do now, is, people like Chad Stileski and Scott Adkins. Yeah, fast, really inventive, like complicated fight scenes. You know. And, it, and you want it to be like a really uh, in-depth, sort of difficult, sort of dart sequence. That's what you're watching. Exactly, yeah. You know, but with just kicks and punches. Exactly. This, is, oh, this is so good. <laughs> <sighs> like that bit when he sort of just, they, they slow it down. He just like freaks out, doesn't he? My wife came in at this point when we were watching it the other day. And just <laughs> shook her head and walked out again. <laughs> It's 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 a it's very much a film for men. Oh, it and is, isn't it? F- their fantasy <laughs> of being a hero in martial arts, isn't it? You know, in, in their mind, it, you look at it, and go, this just works. This is perfect. This it's will it's all happen. You know, but for anyone outsider, any outsider looking in, you know, like this is very silly. <sighs> it's like, what's he doing? <laughs> I'm surprised this isn't a meme. Somewhere, well, maybe it is, but oh, there is, mate. Meme- There's loads of like Van Dam like fire behind him. Just oh, so yeah, what, what are you going to add to this to make it a, a funny meme? Yeah, there's so much opportunity. You could add a lot of you could you could add a lot of fart noises to this sequence. <laughs> it would work, you know. Um, I think people have actually, but I love his bit. He's, he's channeling his his energy. He's chi, isn't it? You know, and he's you know 
going to operate blind now. Whoa! <laughs> it's, 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 I, I wouldn't have slowed mode that kick. I no. Like that n top speed. I didn't notice that time, but a couple of the slow-mo shots have at least shown us that real contact's being made, including on Van Damme, because you see the, yeah. you know, you see the flesh ripple. And they were selected for slow motion, so they've, they've put it in a high frame rate, you know, to shoot it. Yeah. So it's not just like, um, well, now, digital, everyone does shoot, martial arts movie, just put to shoot everything at 48 I, I do, or 96, yeah. Yeah. and just, you have to slow it down in the frame rate, in the, in the app. Well, not yet, yet, you know, the software, but often it often appears too quick because of shutter speed. Yeah. It seems, I think it's too sharp. You know, it doesn't seem real. Um, yeah. Okay, it's building up now. He's, he's getting close. He's getting close. He's going he's gonna to grab him. Whack. Here we go, look. <laughs> oh, the music's helping a, a lot here, but it's like, what is this? The, is this we, like, we cut to her laughing as if... I think. So, presumably it's meant to be a joke. This is Van Damme taking the piss. Kind of thing. <laughs> but the look on his face is not revealing that. It's it's like, no. we're meant to think it's a joke, but no one told Van Damme. <laughs> the joke's on him, you know. Here we go. Oh, it's, 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 it's the stuff it's, that Van Damme was known exactly. for. Exactly. I mean, that's... that Back Helicopter in the day, kick. for anyone younger... Than us listening to it's this, it's mind. You've got to realise that was just something else. Yeah, it really was. Oh, just something everyone wanted to do, you just couldn't do it. Really, I, I spent years trying to do the splits. After this, I took up um, kickboxing. And, did you? Yeah, not for long. I did. Ta I did taekwondo <laughs> ah. for a bit. Yeah, I was, I was, I was pretty flexible, but uh, not anymore. But the whole objective was just to see how high I could kick. That was all any all anyone yeah. really cared about was trying to kick for it. And that's just Van Damme's influence entirely. He was, yeah. Just trying to copy his technique, you know, to make it look good. Not that not not that if it could actually hurt someone or the impact of it. It's more about does it look good? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Does it look good in the mirror? <laughs> Which, you know, I mean, that, that's also what Hong Kong was doing. You know, the, if anything, even more. The blows landed in Hong Kong action movies, you know, don't seem to have any effect on their opponents most of the time. Oh, God, no. Yeah. It's not like the Chuck Norris style where it's, you know, it's pretty authentic and this is actually how a fight would go, or, or a tournament fight anyway, you know, a sanctioned sports fight. I think with, with Van Damme stuff, after Bloodsport, I mean, we had a, a few... Obviously, a few more martial arts kind of movies, kind of a mix of them. A Wall was very much martial arts, um, but Universal Soldier and stuff. I think Hard Target was the next one. I thought that really impressed me with Van Damme, even though he's kind of doing his usual traits, but he's doing more of it and he's doing like you know, kind of a little bit more creative sort of kicks and stuff. Thanks to John Woo mm. and his influence and a lot of slow mo, and um, and he knows how to f film. Van Damme, who so just looks great in every shot, mm. despite rocking a kind of you know, <laughs> questionable mullet. Oh, I'd um, rather have that mullet than this hairstyle. Yeah, I suppose so. On Van Damme, not on me though, or you. <laughs> we both look very goofy. But... I'd, I'd take any hairstyle that is a style, to be honest. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Yeah, by the time Hard Target came, uh, Hard Target was the first Van Damme movie that came out when I was kind of an adult, and, or uh, starting to grow out a little bit more out, out of these kind of movies and a little bit more into Bruce Lee. So, okay, okay. Because I was just uh, that bit older, you know, I was 19 or whatever by then. So I did, I liked it, but it, I, I think I, I no longer uh, like adored everything he did and said. Yeah, I, I, you know, there's a, I think you're, I think with Van Damme, I was a hardcore fan for like a, a couple of years, and then you sort of get influenced by other movies because you, because you, you essentially fall in love with the genre of martial arts, and you, there's kind of better movies to watch to really feed your hunger for more kind of crazy, elaborate fight scenes. And Hong Kong cinema and Jackie Chan was the guy, yeah. you know, to sort of, and even though he wasn't that big in in Europe in the early '90s, you know, watching Operation Condor, like you know, uh, you know, Armor of God two and. Um, like police story yeah. one and two, just blew me yeah, away. Yeah, absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. Um, 
but there's but there's always something that will pull you back to Van Damme. You yes. know what I mean? Because it's it's it's, it's irony, his charm usually. and his yeah irony. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's something that's always because you end up appearing in some kind of interesting movie like Time Cop. You're like, oh, that's great. That's one me over again. Here we go. This motion picture is based yeah. upon true life events of the life of Frank W. Dukes. And then we get the, the I don't, I don't, we get the statistics, the bogus records. The, you know, the stats that come up in a minute are just hilarious. They make it makes if you just think for a moment of what they're saying. They make most of them don't make any sense. You've got like the fastest punch with knockout, which is measured in seconds. Then you've got the fastest kick with knockout, which is measured in miles per hour. For some reason, <laughs> not 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 kilometers. You know. <laughs> So the fastest punch with the knockout is 0.12 seconds. What, what does that mean? What is it? Most consecutive knockouts in a single tournament, minus 5C, <laughs> what, 5 Celsius. Exactly, yeah, exactly. That, that, they've, I think I've always wondered that. Is that meant to be a 6, 56? 56? It must be. It must be it's clipped out or something, but it looks like 50C. Also, <laughs> seven, 72 miles per hour for a record. I remember looking this up a while uh, years ago. 72 miles per hour is a really slow kick. The the record is like a hundred and sixty or something, and and your average martial artist will kick it well over a hundred. So, but t- tennis players can whack a, a tennis ball one hundred and forty <laughs> miles per hour. So he made up these ridiculous statistics. Not only did no one check to see if they were real, no one stopped to think whether they made sense. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's Monarchal Golden. It's like perfect. <laughs> there's a, actually there's a there's a great bit in the um in the in the official commentary where um. Uh, Paolo, um, what's his name? The guy who plays Paco, Paolo Torsha. Mm. It, 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 it did, I don't think he really understood how made up it was until he did the commentary. And at the end, he, he almost gets really? angry with um, Sheldon Latich saying, like, but why didn't anyone check? Why didn't you check? And Latich is <laughs> saying, well, you, you couldn't check back then. You know, there was no internet. And he just he keeps on at it. But why didn't someone check? Why didn't someone make sure? <laughs> And the teacher's getting a little bit aggro on the subject. Like, there's nothing you could do. And I'm sort of sitting there thinking, well, come on, there is. Fine, there was no internet, but you could have asked around within the martial arts community. You could, it wouldn't have taken a lot of digging to, to find this was bullshit. When this came out and people saw those records at the end, they would have, they would have everyone in that sort of area of, of, of martial arts would have gone, who is this exactly, guy? Exactly, yeah. Never heard of him. What is coming and on? And as you were talking about, there, there was such a trend for, for fake martial artists that mm. they were all well-tuned to spotting them, these real people. I'm surprised Van Damme oh, fell yeah, for it, to yeah. be honest, if he did. Well, I think he was probably a little bit dubious, I imagine so. He was very he... naive, apparently. He does admit to being very naive. but Yeah. But he, I think he, well, because he did stay friends with him then, didn't he? So he, yeah. yeah, it was during the course of the nineties, and Frank Dukes would do a little bit of work on like Double Impact, but um, this is like there's on-set photographs with him. I think he did some fight choreography or something like that. Um, but I think, and then Van Damme would do most of it on his own movies. I think to a to a certain well, degree. Well, yeah, but I think maybe... he's credited with it a lot of the time. I know, I know he's credited with it on Kickboxer. Mm. I know a lot of the uh, choreography on Kickboxer was actually done by uh, one of the guys who plays one of the Kung Fu um, fighters in this movie. I, f- I can't remember his name now. Right, okay. He doesn't have a credit in the movie, though. Steal the Night, Michael Bishop, yeah, that's okay. it. Yeah, because he's from another band. Yeah. Steal the Night, what a tie. I mean, that, that could only sound like it sounds like, couldn't it? A song called Steal the Night. <laughs> Well, yeah, final thoughts on me on this. You know, still a fantastic movie, highly influential, you know. Um, one of Canon's kind of classic movies, one of their best, actually, up there with um, probably Runaway Train and uh, Master of the Universe for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and Canon's got some other good classics in there. But I think this is the one. And it's, it's unfortunate that it kind of came out at the tail end of Canon when they were sort of, you know, losing money but it did uh sort of you know bring them back a little bit and this and cyborg but it wasn't enough to save them because it would have had to make a hundred million but it didn't but you know again a big hit on video and uh and uh made van damme a superstar exactly so, yeah i mean that ultimately that that's that's its legacy whether whether you love it or hate it it it's the movie that gave us van damme because before this he was he'd had his small roles but he was nothing he was nowhere he was literally chuck norris's gopher 
uh, we mentioned this before, I think, didn't we? That it, it, he he was Chuck Norris's whipping boy, just hanging around like a like a keen little puppy, and this is what made him. This is what made his ego. And we've enjoyed his movies and his ego ever since. That's a perfect way to end it, Rob. But yeah, me and Rob will be back with some more commentary soon. And take care of yourselves and goodbye for now. Goodbye for now. <laughs>